today we have with us Mr. Manishankar Ayer, India's first Panchayati Raj Minister, who is going to talk to us about a report that he and his committee have co-authored. Mr. Ayer, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, sir, it's been 20 years since we've had uh, Panchayati Raj. How do you look at in, you know, this journey? Would you say the, ha the glass is half full or half empty? What is your assessment of India's experiment with the Panchayati Raj? I wouldn't like to characterize it in terms of half full or half empty, but rather to say that all the mandatory requirements of the Constitution in respect of Panchayat Raj have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And it is a miracle that is so little understood or recognized in our country that we have about two and a half lakh mm -hmm. elected local government institutions. Mm -hmm. To these, we have elected as many as 32 lakh representatives. Mm -hmm. And of these 32 lakh representatives, about 12 to 14 lakh are women. Mm -hmm. There are more elected women in India alone than in the rest of the world put together. And we've also made provision for not only um, the election to reserved seats of scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and the OBCs, but also that in the, um, in the posts there are reservations for them. And within those reservations, 33% of the seats are reserved for women belonging to these communities. So in terms of deepening our democracy, it's an absolutely miraculous success. But the reason why I think it's so little recognized is that there has been so little genuine empowerment of these institutions in terms of their functions, in terms of their finances, and in terms of their functionaries, that there, there's a long, long way to go. One of the, one of the things that the critics keeps talking about is the lack of political will. Um, you know, when parties come to power, they do not do enough to uh, empower the Panchayati Raj institutions to do their job. Whereas when they are in the opposition, you know, they talk about empowerment. If there hadn't been political will, do you think two and a half lakh institutions of local self-government with frequent elections and also the various other mandatory provisions like the state finance commissions, the state election commissions, etc. would have come into existence? Clearly, there was a political will to have Panchayat Raj. But has there really been a lack of political will to undertake the tasks of devolution? My answer is no. There has not been a lack of political will. It's simply that nobody seems to have understood how exactly the devolution process works. In other words, we've attempted to show that there's no contradiction between a continuing role for the center and the state in respect of these institutions when they bring in the Panchayat Raj institutions. And so we hope that we will be able to create an atmosphere in which a partnership is established between the center, the state, and the local bodies, uh, which will enable us to more efficiently deliver these public goods and services. For it is clear that the present system of delivery of public goods and services has almost collapsed. You mentioned this partnership, uh, but the way the, you know, the whole system is structured, you, know, it, it, you have the district uh, magistrate or the district uh, collector, who is actually the inspector of of the panchayat, of the panchayati raj system. So, I mean, isn't it flawed in a way? I don't think any country in the world has the complexity of devolution that India has. Partly this is because of our size, partly it's because of our population, but much more because we are one of the few democratic countries in the world, one of the few democratic developing countries in the world. And therefore, the technology or the methodology for devolution had not really been thought out earlier. It was assumed that if you decree devolution, then devolution will take place. And I would be happy to have the district magistrates keeping a benevolent eye on devolution because things can go wrong and it is their duty to see that if things go wrong, then they should be set right. But the actual exercise of effective power must be by elected representatives for they alone are responsible to the electorate that took them. The fact is that with more than 8% growth in the 11th plan, the rate of poverty alleviation has been only 1.5%. 
So on the income front, our model of growth is going to inevitably result in widening disparities of income and wealth. And to compensate for that, we have to provide public goods and services efficiently. And we now see that the bureaucratic system or the bureaucracy plus NGO system that has been evolved is unable to do that. And therefore, we need to go back to the vision of Mahatma Gandhi, the vision of Jawaharlal Nehru, the vision of Rajiv Gandhi and the vision set out by Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. You know, we, a lot of our, uh, my colleagues, you know, have been traveling to different parts of the country to assess, uh, you know, the, the status or the health of the Panchayati Raj institutions, how the devolution has happened or not. I met the district collector of Madurai and I did put this question across to him as to, um, you know, him being the inspector of the Panchayati Raj, uh, uh, of the Panchayat, how does he, I mean, how does he make sure that his job doesn't interfere with that of the Panchayat? And he said that, look, uh, you know, training, lack of training, lack of education, uh, you know, prevents, uh, you know, the, the village council, the, you know, the Panchayat from actually, you know, g delivering their job properly. The most important training is of the district magistrate and of all his officers. There has to be an orientation of the minds of these people. And in this, in this context, it is shocking that at the National Academy of Administration in Masuri, where IAS officers and other senior officers are trained, at the present moment, they have only a few hours of training on Panchayat Raj. Fortunately, that is changing, and we are going to have a much more serious course on that. But it's taken 20 years for the National Academy of Administration to discover that the real training and capacity building is of our functionaries. And only then do the elected representatives come in. Now, when we don't have any training for MPs and MNAs, why do you suddenly say that, the most, that these people lack the capacity? The fact is that they are political representatives. And as such, they are, represent, they are responsible to the electorate that elects them. And they will continue or not continue depending upon the will of the people. But in performing their functions, first they need to be told clearly what are your functions so that on-the-job training takes place by their fulfilling those functions. If you don't give them the functions, how are they going to be trained? Equally, if the finances are retained by the bureaucracy, then where do they have the wherewithal with which to undertake these functions? And then if the functionaries regard themselves as separate from and superior to these elected representatives, then again, there is a dysfunctionality about the way in which Panchayat Raj operates. A lot of um, people that I spoke to said that, oh, we don't have the funds, we don't have the independence to, you know, uh, to plan a project and then execute it because we have to go to the, the, the BDO, the block development officer, then the project gets put up to the district magistrate and finally do we get it, I mean, if at all they do. So this whole question of financial uh, empowerment of the Panchayat, You've, you've mentioned that centrally sponsored sh uh, schemes should be, you know, should come down to the panchayat head. The health of the village panchayat will depend upon what its responsibilities are. Unless and until in each single scheme you decide which are the unbundled activities mm -hmm. that are to be undertaken by the panchayats and then fix the share of the total finances in relationship to those unbundled activities and then decide who are the functionaries at which level who will be reporting to the panchayats until you do this in a scientific way you're not going to be able to get it to move whatever system we have today is completely dysfunctional there the outcomes are not commensurate with the outlays and if your outlays go up from 7500 crore to two and a half lakh crore and you get the same result as you were getting when you were spending only 7,500 crore, then there is something really sick in the system that must be replaced by an alternative system. One question about women, you know, the participation or, you know, reservation of seats for women. Now, it just seems that, you know, uh, suddenly, without even asking, you know, this act has given reservation for women. And it just feels that, you know, the, uh, you know, this has not been, you know, its full potential has not been explored. What, uh, what in your report have you recommended for, you know, for women to take full advantage of um, the powers that have been given to them under the Panchayati Raj Act? We what, are basing ourselves 
on the only comprehensive survey that's ever been done. That was when I was Minister of Panchayat Raj, we did a sample of 20,000 res respondents from the panchayats, 16,000 of whom were women and 4,000 were men as a control. And there were many, many positive things that have come out. Unfortunately, because there is this phenomenon of the Sarpanch Pati, there's a kind of focus on that in order to denigrate the system. You said that there wasn't a demand from the women. But if the presence of women had not been important, do you think most state governments would have gone from one-third reservations to 50% reservations? It's quite clear that a very, very large number of women are actually being politically and socially empowered as a result of Panchayat Raj. And that this is seen as desirable by the political class, which is why it's now on a national scale about to happen that that one-third reservations will become half. It's very important that the misinterpretation of the provision for rotations be changed. Tamil Nadu was the first to show the way. The constitution requires that there be rotation of reservations for women and for SCST, etc. But this is happening every single election in most states, which means that Anybody from, uh, from the women or any uh, person from a disadvantaged section of society has only a five-year tenure. And just about the time that he or she is picking up what's to be done, the seat gets rotated and most of them fail to get re-elected or even nominated. We have recommended that at least every 10 years, we should have a minimum for rotation and preferably go up to 15. So then if in the panchayats, a woman who gets elected is able to get re-elected twice over, then she will be as fully empowered as any man in the panchayats. So we need, a, we need two things to be done. On the one hand, the effective empowerment of the panchayats in terms of functions, finances and functionaries. And on the other hand, a change of the rotation system to allowing women who get elected to at least remain for two terms, that means 10 years, and preferably for three terms, which would mean 15 years. And that would greatly alter the whole, comp the whole profile of women in panchayats. Thank you very much for being on this show. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for having me. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. Please stay tuned for more.